Hello and welcome back to another episode of Data Analytics Chats, um, where we explore different topics in the data science and AI world with the aim to impact the audience. Uh, I'm back in Spain now and really excited for this topic today. We will explore how to turn, uh, turn high volume of information into data deep insights. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Arvind Balasundaram, who is the Executive Director for Commercial Insights and Analytics at Renderon Pharmaceuticals. He has a wealth of experience in the pharma market, especially work for large organisations such as Johnson & Johnson and Sanofi. Uh, do you want to briefly introduce yourself, Arvind? Sure, sure, Ben. First, I want to take the opportunity to thank you for this. I, I don't get to talk about data and analytics a lot, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to our chat. So, so thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> the only thing is I'd rather be in Spain doing this live with you, but, but some other day. So, I, so my background is I lead the insights and analytics function on the commercial side at Regeneron. We're a biotech about 45 minutes north of New York City. Our goal is to really, you know, do good for patients and 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 as a result do well as a company right so so that is what we're about my remit is i run a group of about 60 people i have four domains that i oversee customer insights which is kind of your classic market research and, and that area analytics which includes business performance analytics and, and data science i also have commercial data management and field reporting and and finally incentive compensation and alignments so so that's my group um, and I'm really looking forward to kind of chatting with you about topics that are pertinent to both of us. So, yeah, of course, yeah, definitely. I mean, like I said, it's a before in the chat. It's a popular topic. This, I think, obviously, businesses are growing. Obviously, more data is going to evolve. Um, and I guess that even in your industry, I guess, obviously, there's always been lots of uh, data, isn't there, in your industry? Oh. And I guess. You deal with the sensitive from uh, sensitive data as well, which is correct. Correct. Even more, you got to be even more cautious, I guess. <laughs> correct. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's why I love the 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 subject matter we're going to talk about, right? It is it's, it's 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 very exciting because of the challenges. So I look forward to it. Yeah, definitely. Cool, cool, cool. So let's start straight in. So what is uh, i mean why is it important for organizations to transform large volumes of data into actionable insights then yes yeah, so so you know data is exactly what that says it's it's just data and large volumes of data is also just data right and and data by itself doesn't deliver impact because it lacks kind of the meaning and the structure and the relationships that one needs to really deliver impact to a business and, and to get to insights, right? So, so I think the most important function is actually how you take that data, irrespective of whether it's a small amount of data or a large amount of data, into a more meaningful process where you can look at relationships, where you can look at correlations, you can look at causal linkages increasingly, you know, what is the logic underlying kind of each of the bits of data and, and organize it in such a way that you take that data, you know, a, a couple of steps forward. You take data into kind of information. That information then over time becomes knowledge. That knowledge then delivers the wisdom, which is really the insights and impacts that any business is after, right? So, so I like to really think about data and analytics as a journey, as opposed to data and analytics as as pieces in a flow, right? So rather than within those bits and 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 i'm sure i'll come back to this theme but it is an evolution that's going on with with all the change around us so so that's what i would tell you yeah and i guess it's good for businesses because obviously if you're looking at your past data it's you can look at how to improve your decisions and then obviously from that that's going to snowball isn't it to improve your competitiveness competitive advantage revenue growth so got the right structure in place it's gonna it's not the knock on effect isn't it yep and 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 i think that's why we need to kind of transform data for the reasons you're mentioning right is is just because it's there doesn't mean it answers the question and and sometimes you know and the, it's the wrong question it's, it's very easy to directly go into data 
and and then end up addressing the wrong question right and and so one of the things i think we need to do as analytics professionals and practitioners is is think about whether we're answering the right question has that been formulated correctly before we kind of jump into the the solution mode which a number of us tend to do because that's how it's been in our dna traditionally right so so i i think it's a very important point to recognize that data has to transform into insight and and that's increasingly becoming a, a very important piece of the journey that's going to require yeah. understanding of all the pieces and yeah definitely i think for this us is getting more complex is no lie and like with that it's, i guess you can go to any direction couldn't you there and this i guess you need to like you said align to what you actually the insight you want to achieve because there's sort of many things businesses can get sidetracked to. Yep, and and it's it's very easy to report a wrong finding, thinking it's insight. You know, and that does happen a lot. It's just getting, as you know, more expensive to do deeper, higher level analytics. And so there is, in some sense, a cost dimension to not specifying your business problem correctly, because you could go down a rabbit hole, solve a problem that is the wrong solution and the wrong problem. Right, so all of that kind of has to come together to deliver impact. Yeah, so obviously, like we mentioned, it's not easy. I guess you should say that's. The but it's still fun, so that's that's the important. Yeah, because I, I think also you look at what's it the stats? Like Eighty percent of data projects fail, but I don't. Obviously, I was had this conversation with David, another lead, and he sort of said you can't actually achieve your result can you also you can achieve steps but it's constantly like you mentioned it's constantly evolving yep. so you, you you're constantly chasing your tail isn't you really because new things come and it's yep. a never-ended cycle yep absolutely um, absolutely so what what are some of the challenges you face when you've dealt with like high volumes of data and how have you overcome them yeah, so so let me let me start with just the amount of data we're dealing with, right? So so for example, in healthcare, in our system, by I don't know, I'm relying on some estimates that may have changed because it's changing every minute as we speak. We're we're talking, you know, terabytes and petabytes of data, right? Which which many analytics people don't know what that really is, but you know it. But it's an extreme amount of information that is just growing leaps and bounds. So so, you know. 745 million floppy disks, as I tell people, right, or 1.5 million CD-ROMs is, is really what we're dealing with in healthcare with about 25,000 petabytes of data, right? Now, obviously, we don't touch all of it in the same stretch, but a subset of that amount is still a big amount, right? So so, so the first thing for us is obviously the, the extensive amount of information that, that shows up. Now, it would be great if all that information showed up and just talked to each other but that is not how it presents right as we know and 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 some of it is structured and has you know a definite dictionary where you can fit things in some of it is unstructured in fact 80 percent of it is unstructured right and and that includes numbers that just aren't organized to be able to do anything with but then it also includes increasingly with social media you know text inputs it includes you know, images, it includes audio, it includes all kinds of information that is really, as we go into AI and, and, and some of, you know, the LLMs and multimodal LLMs and all of that, and where we're going with it, all of that is going to be required to be integrated to deliver an appropriate inference, because otherwise all you're looking at is only one piece of the pie, right? So, so that's another challenge. And, and, you know, the pace at which it's coming at us is, is just, incredible right and and this affects me every single day on the business as i'm sure it does other people in your audience we're in a streaming world right which means we have to have knowledge on the go so if you envision you know the analogy i always use is a funnel you know and and what's happened to the traditional funnel is the mouth of the funnel has really really expanded to a great degree so there's a lot going in and you know the spout of the funnel and what's coming back has shrunk so we have to deal with a lot more, but deliver it in a lot less time and very, very efficiently and on the go. So that that is the other challenge. And and finally, you know, data as we get into structure and unstructured, it, it's just by nature it, it it's full of uncertainties, right? But the business expects you to deliver 
very reliable and predictable information, right? So, so the inherent nature of the uncertainty in the data, when you combine it with the amount of it, the speed at which it's coming, and and you know the types of data that you're dealing with, that's a huge problem, right? So, so data used to be. I, I vaguely remember going back and I'm dating myself, but it used to be all about detection, right? If, if we got 30 or 30 plus sample points, we were like really excited to do an you know, an analytics problem, not very far back, but now it's a problem of not of detection and finding data. It's, it's more a problem of curation and organizing data and, and really making the decision, what is the data that is really necessary to solve a business problem, right? So, so that is what I would tell you is the biggest challenge. And so the way you solve it is, is really to go and pay more attention to curation and, and how that curation will require appropriate cleaning steps. How do you transform all of that clean data into usable insight to deliver impact? And, and that's where storytelling and those elements come in as well. Yeah, no, I think I'll see, again, speaking to many leaders, that, that quality is a massive challenge for businesses. And also you've had the boom last year. So it's creating more unstructured data for you. So it's yeah, yeah. more work. And then I guess that's why you see the massive, well, a massive increase in like data engineering now. There's, there's a lot more, obviously from my side of view, there's a lot more opportunities in that field because before it's all about well, the data scientists will go and create models, but actually it's got to go back a few steps to actually get the improved uh, data quality. Yep, and data quality, you know, I'm, I'm so happy you brought that up because, you know, data quality for most analytics professionals before used to be a very passive engagement, right? Because that was just assumed and you went and dipped your, you know, started delving into the analytics process. But, and I'll, I'll come back to this at some point, but. The fact that analytics is now a journey means the analytics professional needs to be as well versed and, and immersed in the structure of data, the environment of data, the lineage of data, you know, and all of those components, because if a journey is fluid and continuous, all of those dimensions matter to quality that you you are going to deliver to an end user, right? So, so I think it's a very important point. Yes. And then, so what, what strategies would you recommend for collecting like high quality data from various sources? Yeah, so so I think a lot of the so if it's primary data collection, right? So so then obviously you want to be very very alert about the sources that are giving you that information. You want to make sure that the behavior is 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 actual real behavior. You could get stated data, for example, that sometimes, you know, as as a lot of us in analytics say, you know, you, you have outliers and then you have out and outliers, right? And, and, and so you, you, want to, you want to make sure that what people are saying is actually something that is indicative of how they're going to behave, right? So it's a primary, I think to get good data, you can't just collect it. You've got to kind of look at it, mine it a little bit to see that, you know, hey, does this validate some of the observed behaviors I see out there? But most of the massive data sets are in the secondary realm. Right, that's where we have kind of the huge amounts of data. For example, in healthcare, a lot of our prescription data, a lot of you know, physician behavior, all of that, is 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 massive, right? And and what we really look for there, and as as I'm sure they do in other industries, is 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 that data accurate? Has that been independently verified? Is the data collection process actually sound? Right, and what I mean by that is, you're never going to be able to get to the universe. Right, you're going to have to go off a sample. Is that sample complete? Is does it represent all of the the entities you want to be looking at? Is the projection from that sample to that universe because it's massive and could provide a lot of differences in entities? Is that projection methodology itself good? Right. So so you don't want to roll up your sleeves and and examine that the way the supplier of that data actually projected that data is accurate because otherwise you're just using data that you're assuming is correct and, and it may not hold in the sample, right? So so there's that dimension. There's various aspects of, you know, accuracy in data from the point of view of the, the content of the data. Is the data actually, you know, do you not have many missing values and fields? Because as we all know, that can be very problematic. 
and and then you have to substitute values and that kind of takes away the power of the data itself in terms of variation so there's that whole bit you want to look for outliers you know you you, you don't want too many outliers you you want some semblance of a distribution in your data and 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 even if you have very varied data you want a strong understanding of you know what are the degrees of variance that that data represents because these all become extremely important when you get to the analytics end of the spectrum so so those are the steps that we use you know and 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 we look for you know what i would say is completeness of data you want all the information that you're really looking to analyze to be present in that data set you you want consistency right you want the same field being exactly the same wherever it appears in the data set we have dealt with data sometimes where the same thing is re differently represented right this just happens sometimes but you don't want to go into an analysis without that result right so so there are those steps that that we look at that that really ensure that the, the data is good and and is, is really clean to be able to use it for analytics and also i think obviously because you've know, got a different types there, you've got to leverage different technologies, I guess, and then also training the team members, that's, that's got to include that into the mix. Yeah, and, and I think, Ben, what I would tell you, right, is, is I, I love the question you asked, right, because as, as I mentioned before, you know, all of this, the, the, the parts before the data got to the analytics practitioner, even today, used to be handled primarily as a an ETL task, right, by by information technology. It is now changed, right? It it is very important and, and I know, you know, since you work in the in the talent space, you know, this is one of the really, really uh, missing skills, right? Is is we need, especially as we go into machine learning and deep learning and, and all of that stuff, you need a very good understanding as an analytics professional, as a data scientist of you know the data environment you know data governance you know how is data transformed you know all how is data provisioned and, and made ready for analytics because unless you participate actively in that process you're pretty much captive to whatever you get right so so i think it's a very important question that you asked and one that doesn't really get the importance in analytics discussions even today but I think you're going to see that changing very, very rapidly. It's already changing. Yeah. No, no, so this, I mean, this, I mean, it used to be like, what's it, DBA's job, wasn't it? I mean, that's, even data engineering, that's completely evolved now. I mean, even like we're seeing like requirements more, I guess more, because like, you've got the data aspects, BI, but then also like the, the software type skills coming in now as well. So it's, I guess, Yes, yeah, constantly evolving, isn't it? The skill sets, and obviously yeah. you got to have that data knowledge, and then also software skills. It's it's a lot, isn't it, to under for someone to learn and master. Yep, yep, and and that's why you know many many groups, including ours in in analytics, have you know a data management oversight function, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it's akin to the you know the kitchen and the restaurant, and, and I'm sure you've heard this analogy many times, but. You know, people used to talk about IT being in the kitchen and the analytics people and stakeholders being in the restaurant. And, and what's really grown over time is, is the, the brokering between the kitchen and, and the restaurant, right? And, and that's the role of, you know, what I would, they're not quite data engineers, they're not quite data analytics professionals, but they've got to talk both languages and they've got to broker that conversation because of the complexity and speed with which this is coming at us, right? So. So it is an evolution. It's it's a very rapid evolution, and and I think you're going to see a lot of organizations kind of getting on this bus if they're not already there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. This, yeah. I mean, also then you got other things like data privacy and all that's coming. It's, oh, that's it's, all growing, it's growing, isn't it? So yeah. obviously, I guess depending on the size of your company, obviously if you've got that investment already behind you, it's going to be a lot easier, isn't it? Um, yeah. Obviously, yeah. smaller companies. That's where the challenges lie. So you, you touched a base on it. So how I mean, how crucial is sort of data cleaning in the analytics process? And then what I mean, what tools or methods do you use to ensure this data quality? Yeah. So so I mean, I think it goes without saying, especially for all the reasons I outlined why it's getting overwhelming to do analytics these days. That the cleansing of data is probably the the most important ingredient in in the exercise, right? And and 
and and there's several things you need to do right it's not the simpler data sets we had it's it's very complex and 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 so the first thing i think you want to do is is just have some way to make data available to someone in analytics right and 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 that's easier said than done right it, just because there's data doesn't mean it, it should be available as is right so that requires some governance aspects which are, which has to be overarching right it, there there has to be some way in which that availability is made usable it's made secure for privacy other reasons you know and and enterprise risk right so and it's becoming a very big thing with open ai and data inputs coming in from there right so the data governance umbrella probably is an important step we obviously give being in healthcare really you know spend a lot of time there which is i see that as part of a cleaning process many people don't but i think it is right and in terms of the inputs that you actually use in an analytics process we test our data right for again because a lot of our data comes from data providers right you you want to proactively get ahead of you know what i would call the known unknowns for example you know sometimes you have a physician let's say who is in one group practice but also in another group practice right so you have the same physician kind of with two different numbers if you're trying to find insights about a physician without taking into account the various domains in which they practice or whether they have an individual practitioner office and a practice in a hospital you need business rules to kind of integrate you know what you're trying to do right so there's that component of cleaning which we pick up in data testing and and you know you want some way because of the the disconnected nature of data coming in you want some kind of cataloging of all of those databases which is important from a cleaning standpoint as well because if you don't know what databases are coming in you can link all of them right and and if you want to link all of them you have to start with things like unique identifiers and you know the whole single source of truth idea that that you know you want to master a data set in only one place right in a central place you don't want it being mastered in multiple places so there's there's all of those steps that i think used to be in the domain of it again but you know are very much now on the part of groups like commercial data management which which have to have a, a very very important role in talking to the analytics people who use it as well as the it people who load and provision it so so those are all steps i know we take i'm also aware a lot of other organizations take the same same steps as part of the data cleaning and and you know provisioning steps yes. Cool. And any particular tools you could recommend to the audience or is it across the broad above? It's it's really it depends, I think, very much on the environment, the types of data, you know, that there there are there are a whole host of tools, Ben. You know, and, and I'm I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure I know all the tools that even we use because they, they keep changing depending on the formats. Yeah. But you know, there's a variety of tools depending on the type of data that you use, you know, the, the how quickly has to be done the frequency with which the source data mm-hmm. comes in you know all of those issues right and 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 so i i couldn't speak very intelligently to the exact tools but yeah. you know i i do know there's a variety and not just a single tool obviously you know the the nirvana's data observability and i think we have you know tools out there like single platforms that do all of the things right but mm-hmm. but even those you know we are, we are still evolving in that domain yeah things keep changing so it's you yeah. got to keep isn't it like it's no it's no there's no end it's not like you complete you've done it it's a hundred other tasks get created i guess like with gen ai isn't it it's been creating yeah. such such a buzz but i guess for people who like your game it's probably creating a lot more headaches because you've got all this more work <laughs> correct and, and that can be a challenge with stakeholders and and leaders and organizations sometimes right because they see the tip of the iceberg so that's where the gen ai and you know the llms and all of the fancy analytics and omni channel and attribution all of that is on that top but what's underneath is what yeah. we are talking about, right which yeah. is where the real work is right and 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 an understanding of that is required yeah no, exactly uh, so you just on about like in fast analytics there so what what's some like advanced analytic techniques that can be can help in extracting deep insights for like these large data assets so you know i i think it depends on the type of analytics one does that that's how i would choose to address it you know 
it, it depends. Are you really trying to just assess what happened or, you know, why it happened, which tends to be more descriptive diagnostic, you know, then, you know, that's primarily trying to run the analytics machine, you know, looking at the rear view mirror, right? Those, those tend to be simpler, you know, and, and the analytics we typically use either starts with reporting or some kind of BI tool, but then, you know, gets into, you know, some level of regressions and, and, you know, basic kind of what we would call business performance analytics. But then when you get into the, the real meat of it, you know, in the predictive and prescriptive side, right, where you're trying to inform, you know, what is likely to happen, where you're, you're looking through the windshield, as, as I allude to it, or, or inform the business what should be done. Then you're getting into the real meat of advanced analytics and data science, right? You get into domains like, you know, marketing mix analytics or, or you know, machine learning, deep learning type, type uh, inferences, more of the data scientific type methods. And, and so there's a variety of them depending on where you choose to plug in. I, I think increasingly organizations are relying more and more on predictive and prescriptive. I, I would even argue COVID has done that because, you know, the world got comfortable with yesterday's right and knowledge of yesterday until COVID hit and, and it just changed our parameters around and, and so the whole focus on trying to be able to predict as I as I think become very important. And and I would also tell you, you know, advanced analytics has also evolved in the sense that, you know, decision makers are now able to live with directionality in some cases and abandon explainability for prediction because and that's where that's why you see i think the rise of machine learning and, and those types of methodologies you know we've done that for eons in some other domains like plate tectonics where we're, we're very good at explaining but horrible at predicting right and and so that's kind of the nature of the beast even in business as covid informed us and and so we have to constantly juggle using advanced analytics for these two purposes and and so we we use a lot of very complicated you know and advanced analytics in that prediction and prescriptive space whether it's promotional optimization whether it's you know market structure and, and those types of analytics to understand the market whether it's forecasting right and 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 you know being able to predict what i would call possible futures right and rather than just probabilities of what might happen you know it's shifting to possibilities of what might happen, which is a slightly different nuance when you think about it, right? Which requires, again, you know, a lot of complicated analytics to get there. But these are all examples of, you know, the evolution of data science, which kind of combines that multivariate statistics and, and predictive modeling and, you know, with an understanding of technology, machine learning and algorithmic ways of exploring data and, and you know, a business relevance. How do you bring all that together at the end of the day to make sense of what the business actually needs. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, there's lots of different models as well. <laughs> so I mean, how would you integrate data from different sources to create a cohesive data set for analysis? This is the $6 million question, Ben, is, is we're in a world of connected data, right? If you don't connect the data, you're just paying for a database, right? Because data is expensive. And if you don't connect it, you're not going to get good analytics, right? You get better yeah. analytics, you link it. So, so it, it's a very important question because that's where the value is. And, and you know, it, it really involves taking the data streams, looking for, you know, again, universal identifiers, trying to tie that in. Sometimes you have to tokenize data for privacy reasons, right? In, in, in the sense that you got to use some kind of surrogate token to, to you know, maintain the relationships. But, but not compromise, you know, sensitive information. There's data aggregation sometimes. For example, we deal with specialty pharmacies in the area of biologics, right? Which, which is a very complicated area from the point of view of data generation. And, and if you go into the data streams there, you can't even start analyzing it because you've got to first aggregate that data because it's so messy and chaotic. And by aggregation, I mean, you've got to get it to a higher level of organization to even think about how you want to start analyzing, right? So, so there are a lot of these types of steps that I think have to take place in terms of getting it analytics ready. And, and so that's how we end up, you know, either linking data sets, making sense of it. You know, we, we really look for single source of truth in most cases, because you have a variety of suppliers of data uh, often 
the analytics was all trying to predict the same thing, right? And and you want to make sure that the data that you're hitting in analytics ultimately is not only linked, but is saying the same thing irrespective of how you approach it, right? So so that is a very important part of linkage, and and it's an area that is getting it's to be its own specialized view of the world on the data side, right? Is how do you create single source of truth and, and, and central mastering of data and, and govern how it is used across the enterprise. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. And then, obviously, yeah, obviously getting the data is yeah, challenging enough. And then, I mean, how do you effectively visualize and communicate the insights that you've derived from the last data sets to the non-technical stakeholders? So we could spend a day on this subject, right? Uh -huh. in, so in, 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 in volumes have been written on this <laughs> subject, but you know, I'll I'll I'll, I'll throw out two quotes I, I often use with people, right? Is is the, the Nobel laureate Herbert Simon, you know, essentially said that a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention, right? So so a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention, and and I think it's a very important point, right? Which it speaks to the need for curating data that is specific to answer the question that one is tasked with, right? And 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 it requires a discipline in this day and age to do that. The the second piece is is a is a quote from you know David Thoreau. And and I like it because I'm also an art buff, right? I go to museums in New York City and I keep thinking about this every time I look at a Monet or a Picasso, right? It's is you know it's not what you look at it's ultimately what you see, right? And, and this is fundamentally why visualization is important in analytics, right? Because visualization transforms the ability of somebody to look at data and to see a bigger picture in it, right? And, and, and that combined with curation and integration is what really leads to effective storytelling, right? And, and, and so, you know what I try to do, and what I work with my team to do often is is really question number one: is the question correct? Because you don't want a great story if the plot itself is is off the rails, right? So, so is the question correct? And if the question is correct, what is the purpose of the the narrative or the story that we're developing? Then, what is the what is the minimum amount of data we need? To, to stay within the purpose that we're after, right? And these are all very logical steps to effective storytelling. And, and then closing the story with impact, right? Why should somebody listen to your story? Why should I read a novel? And and, and so the closure is, is very important. And, and, and I think that's what really gets you credibility, credibility with your stakeholder. And, and really democratizes the analytics process and, and the data journey from where it starts. No, I think, I think impact is the big word. Isn't it? I mean, you've got to offer show value because, yeah. And I, that's, if you don't want to, if you want to make leaps forward, you need to be doing that because yeah. you've got some shiny tool. It's not going to make the ROI, it's going to make the impact. It's not really going to be worthwhile, isn't it, really, when there's, maybe another way you could make such a drastic change to the business. Yep. And, and, and I think, you know, the four eyes, like I say, is you start with inputs, you go into interpretability that takes you then to insights and the insights take you to impact, right? That is the connection really from a business stakeholder standpoint on data into analytics, right? And it's very important for us ultimately to recognize what is that higher order purpose for which we engage with data and analytics, right? And and it's becoming a very big issue, as you know, with AI here, right? Interpretability, explainability, you know, responsibility, all of them have that linkage. So this is not going to be a very easy journey, but it's it's a very challenging and fascinating journey that, that I hope a lot of the folks listening to this, as well as, you know, as, as I tell my young talent, I'm very envious of them because you know the challenges are overwhelming, but but the adventure is is just fascinating. That that you know they'll be able to dabble with all of these new challenges with new technologies, and it's great, right? Yeah. Well, this is interesting from this point of view. He's going to 
or she, sorry, will want, they've got, they've got a million and one things they've got to deliver on. So you've, you've, for their time, you've got to stand out, haven't you, really? You've got to be offering that value, look, let's Correct. do this. If we do this, look, we're going to make massive change to the business. Because they'll say they're, what they see is they want to see my main thing is to increase profit, save or cost savings, really, isn't it? Efficiencies. And if to do that, you need to be showing that because if not, if the budget will have to get spent elsewhere, wouldn't it? In, correct. Correct. So. And, and you know, there's three there's three elements I think that are important: efficiency, which speaks to the bottom line; mm. uh, effectiveness, which speaks to the top line; and accountability, which speaks to return on investments and you know if you have a recommendation mm -hmm. you know you as a as a good analytics professional you should be able to back that recommendation up with metrics and kpis that there's an accountability you know competency that is fundamental to analytics that that is why analytics is a very objective exploration into making recommendations right so so delivering analytics without an associate accountability is is just analytics yeah cool. and i think i think yes especially a lot of people can get lost like because there's so much to be done and i think we've seen it last year with gen ai a lot of businesses for gen ai's go down that path when actually maybe another model would have been a more cost-effective solution yeah yeah and then and gen ai you know we're in the experimental phase right we, yeah, exactly. we have yeah, yeah. ways to go there like you know i'm i'm very excited about for example synthetic data right mm -hmm. where you can synthesize actual data now whether whether we can use it or not obviously depends on you know compliance and legal regulations at enterprises but you know we traditionally have used things like lookalike modeling and things like that right where you want to kind of go beyond your data and find you know future customers Synthetic data actually allows you to get to databases without compromising sensitive information, which none of us wants to do, by you know going beyond a trained data set, but maintaining the patterns in that trained data set and generating new information, which increases you know your sample points for an analytic exercise. So there's there's a lot of great stuff coming down the pike on generative AI. Still early, but but it's exciting nevertheless. Yeah. Cool. No, interesting times ahead. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so then, what, could you share an example where the whole high volume data analysis has led to significant like business insights or decisions? Yeah, I'll actually pull one out from you know a prior life of mine where you know this was in the CNS space and the central nervous system space. And, and it's, it's a technical market structure analytics. It, it's a fairly advanced tool in analytics. And, and this speaks to the idea of, you know, when you are launching a product, and in this case, we were launching a brand in a different dose, right? So, the, so and, and form, right? So we had a, a pill that was available, but what we were looking to launch was an injection that essentially needed to be taken less frequently than the pill right which and and so how do you go about even exploring like how do you launch this how do you impact behavior with with this new option right and and so market structure and analytics and analysis really comes from consumer packaged goods the problem is no different than let's say coke deciding to launch cherry coke uh, it, it it asks the question how does the market partition does it partition on a brand and then underneath it, the type, and and in our case, underneath that, the specialty. For example, would a, a psychiatrist and a neurologist, does it matter that you first figure out what specialty they are before you go to understanding, do they use an injection or a pill? Is their preference more for a pill or an injection with their patients? Or do you actually start with the brand and then this, it ha you know they all gravitate to the brand and then go to a pill or injection and then how specialties use it. So, you know, this is an example where it has tremendous ramifications for strategy because you don't want to go into it just looking at data without understanding how does that data and behavior organize itself. And, and, and depending on understanding that organization, you want to launch the brand appropriately so you get the optimal impact in launching into that right nesting in the market. Right. So, so that's an example I would share with you. It's 
gotten more complicated now because of machine learning and you know, XG boost and all of these types of algorithms that can help to, you know, classification and regression trees. We used to do it using data mining and, and CART and things like that. Uh, but it's, it remains a very fascinating exercise as markets get crowded and more complicated and highlights why analytics is, is integral in driving business strategy and can actually have a lot of impact. Very interesting. And then to end, so what trends do you foresee in dealing with high volumes of information? So I, I will come back to what I said earlier, right? The, the biggest trend, and, and, and I think not enough attention is being paid to this, is data is no longer a commodity. Analytics is no longer a capability. Data and analytics are both a continuous journey. And what that means is people who have traditionally dealt with data will need to get very savvy about how analytics kind of applies itself to the streams of data we're getting. Same way the analytics people who used to just touch what they were given will need to engage more actively in what I would call provisioning and readiness of analytics, right? So that's the first trend. The, the second trend is because of the overwhelming content, and, and I will say content rather than data because of the unstructured maturity we're getting with that data type. Curation, integration, storytelling is going to become extremely important, just like you mentioned. And, and I think the quality of insights is going to be more important than the quantity of findings, right? So, so it's going to be very important for analytics professionals to, to really start delivering quality insights, not just a number of discrete things that kind of stay disconnected because it's getting impossible to, for the organization to wrestle with too many things, right? The, the third thing I would tell you is, you know, augmented decision are going to become very, very important. And and augmented decisions really is where AI comes in, right? Is is It is no longer going to be even possible for us with all of the overwhelming amounts of information and, and the, the very diverse nature of data we wrestle with to either formulate the business problem without some help or come back with an answer deeply confident without some help. Right, and, and this is where augmented analytics is, is going to evolve. It is already evolving with integrated co-pilots and where generative AI will go in, you know, query exploration and those tools are all really, really gonna stick because, you know, being able to understand the context of an original query and being able to generate other queries that may be pertinent to it are gonna be humongously helpful to somebody who is practicing analytics and, and help augment that mindset of the original question, right? So, so those would be, I would tell you the three trends that yeah. I think are going to be very, very important in the journey forward. Yeah, cool. I feel like your point too. The do seem like just seem like it's getting more specialized, like especially like domain, or especially in your area because you've got different regulations, etc. But it does seem like data science is getting. You need to be more like domain focused to get. Obviously, I understand the data more because it's getting more. Obviously, it was quite technical, wasn't it? Before, but I have to say, data science, it's getting more product alignment. So, it's if you've got that domain expertise, that's where you're going to excel because you're going to be able to, I guess, provide the insights. Correct. You, you've got to be in the in the journey to win the journey, right? And and you can be relying on products getting to you without really understanding the quality of the product getting to you. So what goes in and what comes out are related, right? As, as we all know, and, and, and yes. So, the, so, you know, it's gonna become a dynamic journey, continuous, uh, very quickly updating and, and inference on the go. You know, and it, I know that's a phrase, but when you think about it, it has tremendous ramifications for how you apply analytics to inform insights and deliver impact. And, and it's a very exciting journey. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that it's here. I, I think we've been waiting a long time for it to get here, but but it's here and, and we might yeah. as well enjoy it. Yeah, more, lots more interesting times ahead. <laughs> yeah. And a lot more challenges. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Probably a lot more headaches as well for businesses, but obviously it'd be good, be, good, good, good things. Yep. Good, uh, brilliant. Well, I uh, really appreciate your time, Arvind. This has been yeah, a great conversation. And, yeah, hopefully the audience and listeners uh, enjoy it. 
Ben, thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I really enjoyed our discussion. And, and I think, you know, just going back in that journey and, and living those moments is, is thrilling. And, and I, I thank you for the opportunity mm -hmm. to be able to talk with you. And, and I look forward to meeting you in person sometime. Yeah, definitely. When I'm next to the US. <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you, Ben. Yep. Thank you again. Cheers. Bye.